or Scott's slide is still on it. Good. Okay. Uh, I mean, so uh, do you know what a peer to peer system is? Does anybody not know what a peer to peer system is? So it's essentially a system where there's not just a client, there's not like a server and then everybody connects to the server. Instead, everybody in the network is essentially equal and they all just connect to each other. Uh, so that's what it means when it says a peer to peer system. Electronic cash, uh, it is. Bitcoin is like cash in that it's when you when you spend it, it can't be reversed. The only way you can reverse a cash payment is um, you know taking it back from the person with force. Um, and then yeah, so Satoshi Nakamoto is the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin. We don't know if it's a man or a woman or a group of people or not. you know my favorite actually theory is it's an artificial intelligence that gave us Bitcoin. Um, but then they they disappeared about two years later. Um, never to be heard from since. And the, the, basically the main benefits of Bitcoin are that it's, it's, it's a decentralized network. So like I said, it's all these peers connected to each other. There's no, you don't have to trust anybody. Um, it's, it's transparent in that like when you have a copy of the blockchain, which is the digital ledger, you can see where every, every transaction. There's no, there's no way for like, like if a government using Bitcoin, they can hide funds by doing some crazy things. Uh, it's censorship resistant because nobody has, you don't have to get anybody's permission to use it, which goes along with the, uh, I thought I changed this, but uh, you don't have, you don't need anybody's permission to use Bitcoin, you just download some software and you start using it, it's very simple. Uh, no middlemen, uh, pretty it's self explanatory. And uh, the, the last point kind of goes along with the censorship resistance is that you just download a piece of software and you're good to go. Uh, Scott just walked in. He's Chris's partner and also a computer scientist. You want to introduce yourself real quick? Hi, I'm Scott Borden, uh, the co-founder of Sumbits, the Bitcoin ETN company that Chris and I run. Uh, beyond that, I'm a software engineer and computer engineer. Uh, happy to answer any questions that you have. So have. if you have a US dollar, you can take it to a, your ATM machine and put it in and it spits out a, a Bitcoin code, right? You want to explain what your ATM machine means? What does it, what does it do? Get that, get that later? Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm sure that'll be your question. <laughs> okay, so uh, any any questions on the basics of Bitcoin and and how is Bitcoin created? That's a, that's a big question everybody asks. It, yeah, I think 50% of our audience maybe do, doesn't understand mining and how it's created. So I just want to talk about the economics of Bitcoin. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, let me go to your slides. Then. No, no, this is fine. Okay. So, like Gary said earlier, there's a maximum of 21 million that could ever be created. And um, when Bitcoin started in 2009, eight, and so when it first started, um, it was being created at a rate of 50 Bitcoin every 10 months. And then the code says every 210,000 blocks, which comes out about it every four years. Um, the amount of Bitcoin that's created every 10 minutes gets cut in half. So it went from 50 Bitcoin every 10 minutes to 25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes about four years later. And currently we're at 12 and a half Bitcoin every 10 minutes that's being created. Um, and so you have this scarcity. Um, you know, right now there's about, I think, a little bit over 16 million Bitcoin that have been created. And so in um, the nine years Bitcoin's been around, 76% of all the Bitcoin has been created. And it's going to take 140 years to create the next 24%. And so, because it keeps getting cut in half every, every four years. And so when you have a scarce supply and you have demand that's grown at 100% a year, um, that's the demand growth of Bitcoin over the past nine years. Um, and you have you know, demand growing at 100% and you have a scarce supply, then that's what makes the price goes up, go up. And so when people say, you know, what's Bitcoin worth, you know, no one really knows, but you know it's probably going to be worth more in the future because, you know, there's a limited supply and there's more demand. Well said. Yes, I say. Uh, I was just going to ask if maybe we could see if people are interested in hearing more about how Bitcoin works from like a technical perspective or if you'd be more interested in talking about like the economics and, or we could do both a little bit, but. <laughs> How is it created? You say it's created. Is it still a yeah, updated version of this? Did um, you see an extra one? There might have been. You want to drive extra the other stuff in there. Uh, okay, it's fine. Uh, so you want to go to the start with this? What is mining? Sure. So we can, we can talk a little bit about Bitcoin mining. Um, 
So first, I think one of the one of the just kind of terminology that you need to know. The main one is a uh, concept for block. So a block is basically just a container for like a transaction, funds moving from one account to another account. Uh, and so what the we call this we call the process of generating blocks mining. It's just kind of like a term that came to be used somehow. Um, so people who are mining Bitcoin are running generally now specialized hardware that does nothing but this one algorithm just constantly over and over and over again. Um, and what they're doing is they're they're attempting to take all the transactions that are out there that haven't been bundled up into a block yet, and they put them into a block, and then they run this through this this hashing algorithm. Um, and it's, it's it's a little difficult to explain, but essentially what they're trying to do is they're trying to find a result of this from this algorithm that matches this rule. And so once they find one that matches the rule, then they can uh, claim they are allowed to award themselves a certain number of bitcoins. So like Brian said, it started off with 50 bitcoins every time that they solved, would solve this uh, algorithm, and now it's cut, cut in half twice now, now 12 and a half bitcoins every time. And so that's how bitcoins are created. So it's a reward to people who are doing the mining, the, the, the transaction validation, um, for the amount of energy that they produce, or that they, they use producing this, and also for the service of basically making transactions secure. So once the transaction is in the block, um, basically the blocks are linked so that like the next block that's found builds on top of the last one. And so this way you kind of know that uh, the transaction, let's, let's say happened five blocks ago, it has a certain amount of security to it that it can't be reversed. And the farther back you go, the harder it is. Do you have yeah. units? Do you no. have units? No. Okay. Can you, I'm, I'm going to be in the room right now, can you give me a second grade explanation of what you just did? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of uh, Okay, well, so, I mean, one of the problems is that the words mean something to you, but not necessarily to all the people in the audience. Yeah. Sure, and I, I had some slides that kind of broke it down a little bit further, but those are gone. Um, to be honest, you don't really need to know how it works. Just like you don't know how it works. I'm completely serious. Like, do you know how the credit card? The guy RS. Or what is, what is, what is, how does the US dollar work? Like, like, so how yeah. many people understand how credit card authorization and settlement works? All right, how many of you use credit cards? <laughs> I mean, it's, this is, it's essentially the same. It's the, the functional equivalent of, of credit card authorization and, and settlement in that you don't need to know how it works. You don't even need to know about it in order to use Bitcoin and use it securely. Um, it doesn't get a lot easier to explain than that, unfortunately. If, if, I, if I could like draw and stuff, I could kind of like do some diagrams and that kind of thing, get you a better idea, but it uses some very kind of technical concepts in weird ways. Um, There's some very useful videos on YouTube if you Google how does Bitcoin work. I talk and, and you, know, you know, you can watch, you know, this you know, 30 minute video you can find that it, it explains the hashing. And, and this, is a, this is a real photo of a mining center, uh, probably maybe in China or, or wherever, uh, where you have you know, rows of, of computers processing hash or algorithms to create one Bitcoin. That's easier to spend your time with. Down, you know, they get for a kindergarten, which I agree, uh, for you to understand. Uh, so then, after that block is filled, then it goes where? What's the next step after the block is filled from the manufacturer? After they, well, after the, after they create the the Bitcoin, yeah. where does it go then? Uh, so there's basically in every block there's a special kind of Bitcoin transaction called a coin-based transaction, and that's the one that creates the Bitcoins out of thin air, the, the, the miners themselves. Um, and essentially, the way that transactions work after that is um, so every every Bitcoin can be traced back to its Coinbase transaction when it was created by a miner. And then from there you can use, you basically reference the previously unspent Bitcoins, and then you reference those in a transaction and that's called an input. And then you basically, you specify how the recipient must be able to spend those Bitcoins in the output. So like generally an output is just a Bitcoin address. Okay. Uh, maybe we talk about what what does Bitcoin mean to the world right now, uh, which is more relevant to uh, the beginners. Yeah, 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 still? Question still? Oh, yeah. Sorry, Annette. Question still back there? Um, the right no, it's fine. <laughs> yes. 
So you said the demand is rising at 100% for the past nine years. Do you have a forecast for the amount of GPUs? Are they following a similar trend? And you know, because obviously you need the GPUs to mine Bitcoin. So yeah, I don't know. Actually, most mining today is not done with GPUs. It's done with ASICs, which is an application-specific integrated circuit. So it's basically a computer chip that does this one thing, and that's it. How do you determine, or how is, or why, or whatever, however you want to explain it, uh, how is the value put on a Bitcoin? Is it an absolute value? Or is it relative to the market? Andrew, 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 slide up now. So, um, so the market determines the value of a Bitcoin. So, and there's all sorts of theories on, you know, what is the true value of a Bitcoin. So we know today in the United States it costs about a thousand dollars of electricity to generate one Bitcoin. So we know that there's, you know, probably it's worth a thousand, probably at least. But then you have all sorts of financial. Um, you know, financial equations that you can use to determine what a true value is. And I've seen, you know, projections, of, you know, that the intrinsic value of one Bitcoin 20 years from now be a million dollars. And your JP Morgan CEO, Jamie Dimon, saying it's worth zero. So it's somewhere, it's worth somewhere between zero and a million. So it's, it's, it's independent of other currencies? Sure. Totally. Yeah, it's, yeah, it trades just like a foreign currency in this. But a lot more volatile. Do you, want, do you want to explain this chart? You can't explain yeah, so this is a chart I saw um, you know, probably about six months ago. So it's a little bit of data. So it shows the total value of all the coins about 41 billion. And it's right around, I think last time we're about 60 billion now, 65 billion. Um, so you see it in comparison to Apple and Amazon and physical money and gold and you know, all money, you know, just the relative size of Bitcoin today. Um, the way I think about Bitcoin is the future value. If you think about the internet, you know, what's the value of the internet today? You know, and people could argue, you know, it's probably worth at least a trillion dollars, right? You know, I mean, Apple and Google are worth over a trillion combined. So you would think the internet was, you know, it's probably worth a trillion. And I, I think eventually that the Bitcoin network will be just as valuable as the internet is. And, you know, the internet allows us to transfer information back and forth um, free. The Bitcoin blockchain allows the transfer of money back and forth free, or almost free. And so that has value to it. And I think in 10 or 20 years, that network will be worth a trillion dollars. And it's worth you know, $66 billion today. And so between now and then, you know, you'll see huge spikes and drops in Bitcoin price. But I think over the long run, that it's only worth a lot more than it is today. Is, is, there, is there a physical coin? I, they always depict a little thing that looks like a B on there. Uh, with, I thought it was Boston Bru Bruins, but I guess it's <laughs> uh, Is there an actual coin? Uh, the short answer is no. The long answer is that you can basically put a piece of information on a coin that represents a Bitcoin. So there are things called private keys. So like when you have a Bitcoin wallet, what it does is it holds your private keys, which are like the secrets you need to keep that prove, that help you prove that you own the Bitcoin. Uh, you can print those out and you can stick them underneath like a little hologram label. That's usually what the things they're showing you are. It's basically just a collectible made of silver or gold or whatever. And then it's got some Bitcoin value due to the fact that it has like the actual key underneath it. Or you can't drop it into the payphone. No, no. It's a, Bitcoin is all digital. There are, by the way, payphone is something. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a pure, purely electronic currency. Yeah. So, and excuse my ignorance, but so if I was like, hey, I want to invest in Bitcoin, how how do I do that? Like, I'm not tech savvy. I don't understand half the words they're saying. So, like, how do I? go and invest and earn Bitcoin or whatever. Yeah, you have to go to like a Bitcoin brokerage firm basically. Just like when you buy stock, you go to a stock broker, okay. like Schwab or Merrill Lynch or someone like that. You know, when you buy Bitcoin, you have to go to a Bitcoin broker. And how do you um, Or you can buy it from individuals too. Um, or an ATM machine, you can put money in an ATM machine and get it. Um, so I, I buy my Bitcoin through Coinbase. Mm -hmm. um, so they're one of the largest Bitcoin brokers out there. And it's virtual as well? It's like a website? Coinbase.com. Yeah, Coinbase.com. Coinbase. Yeah, Coinbase. Coinbase. Okay. It's just like you open up a Schwab account. 
Okay. Um, you link it to your checking account, which seems kind of scary. Yeah. Um, but Coinbase is also a registered bank. So any cash there is FDIC insured up to $250,000. And then your Bitcoin that's held there, they all they offer Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ethereum. And so their cryptocurrency assets are insured by Lloyds of London. So if Coinbase gets hacked, then Lloyds of London will step in and reimburse you for the hack. But if you get hacked and someone steals your Bitcoin from your account, that's not covered. It's only if Coinbase gets hacked. So you have to protect your password and you know, make sure that no one hacks your account. So you have to be tech savvy to do that? <laughs> no, it's just like protecting your online investment account to oh, okay. your, your bank, you know, bank account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And Thank you, you don't need to buy a full Bitcoin either. You can buy a point zero zero one if you want. Oh. Okay. Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Yeah, Bitcoin is divisible by 100 million. Oh. So, okay. you know, I, I think it takes, the smallest unit is a Satoshi, and it takes about 20 Satoshis to equal a penny. Oh. So that's okay. like, you know, and, and a bit is like one one thousandth of a Bitcoin. So you know, that would be 4,200 or 5,000. So a bit's like, you know, 42 dollars right now. How many different denominations are there? I, I mean, uh, basically there's there's Bitcoin and then there's just other ones that have colloquial names that the community uses. So like the Satoshi was the name given for like the smallest unit. So one one hundred millionth of one Bitcoin. But really other than that, there's not any formal names. It's all whatever people want to call it, honestly. Yeah. You had your hand up and you want to ask you. Oh, it's Phil, did you have to say too? Uh, I was just going to add that uh, when you trade with Bitcoin, you're not really dealing with coins as units, but as a total value. As, as, you know, so you might want to change, you know, I might want to give you $100 in Bitcoin, so that might work out to 0 0.025 or, or whatever. But that's the, that's the quantity that's traded. It's not a particular fraction of a unit. So what you see when you do this is just a whole lot of zeros uh, on your decimal point. And because the, the unit price is you know, 4,000 or whatever it is today and, and growing. But when you want to trade, if you want to trade, you know, th if you want to think about it in dollars, you can do that. And, you know, all these trading firms will, will automatically translate the value for you. So you don't really have to worry about the exact number of Bitcoin you're trading, uh, except for when they also add to freeze on top of that. Yes, sir. Could I mine my own Bitcoins? I'll let you take that stat. Yeah. In, in theory, yes, but usually it's not cost prohibitive to do on a small basis. Uh, a lot of mines out in China, for example, have, uh, back to the mining slide, there's thousands and thousands of these in a facility. Uh, you're dealing with the, the problem of you're using a lot of electricity, so you have to have favorable rates, and then you have to deal with cooling that, because it's essentially a giant space heater. Uh, so yes, in theory, you can create your own Bitcoin, but would it be more profitable to buy Bitcoin or invest in Bitcoin mining hardware? It depends on your circumstances, but typically, uh, you know, buying Bitcoin's the easiest for most people. I think you had your hand up a long time. Yeah, yeah I was just wondering, so there's 21 million in existence, and like we've got the cost of the, the AC miners up so high. It, will there ever be a point where the block reward itself is not justified by the cost of mining it? Well, there are transaction fees, right? You know, um, and, you know, whenever you send a transaction, you have to include a fee that also gets rewarded to the miners. Uh, with that being said, it's still a very small portion. I don't know what the exact amount is on average, but it's a small portion compared to the 12 and a half received right now. In the future, we don't know how that's going to really change, or maybe good value uh, will go up so drastically of the price of Bitcoin that you know even a reward, uh, you know, if it has and has and has again, that's still enough to justify the the cost of mining. But with that also being said, you know, there's no need for the number of miners there are. A lot are becoming very centralized instead of decentralized. Yes. So the wallet that you the, the wallet that you established with whatever transaction company is with them, right? So, uh, well, you continue your question, I'll, I'll answer it. So I guess my question is, is that there's been volatility, I think, in the ways that you can, the companies that you can buy Bitcoin through. 
does that impact your risk as far as your wallet? No. So uh, the question was, does the company, like the, you know, companies going out of business, that kind of thing, or like getting hacked, does that impact the security of Bitcoin in your wallet? I would say no, because as soon as if, if you if you really want to secure your own Bitcoin, um, then as soon as you buy them on an exchange, you move them to your own wallet, and then if that if the exchange gets hacked, uh, nothing happens to your coins. So the wallet is the, the wallet is a piece of software that manages your keys and keeps track of transactions that are relevant to you. So we, like, if you open up your wallet, the first thing you'll see is like your balance, how many Bitcoins you have. And then you'll also see a list of like all of your transactions that, that you've sent and received. Um, and then it allows you to then also take the Bitcoins that you, that you own and send them elsewhere. So that wallet is separate of um, the transaction. Uh, so, so if I'm buying, just play this out, I'm buying them from E-Trade. That's where I buy my Bitcoins through. My wallet is with Trade or with something completely separate, Wells Fargo. And so if anything happens to Wells Fargo, I still own that currency that was in that wallet, or what happens there? I, ideally, so, you'd have a wallet app that would run on your computer, and it would have the, the, the keys stored locally, so you wouldn't even have a Wells Fargo wallet. You may have, um, well, you may have like a, a, a Coinbase application that you exchange with, but um, you know what Chris was saying is you want to have a wallet that's your own, so that way if anything happened to the exchange, you know, you have your, your data protected. And you can do exchange, then with your own wallet, you can do direct transfers to any other Bitcoin user with the address that's provided through the software in your wallet. So using, your, using your analogy of buying at an E-Trade, and then transfer to Wells Fargo for your wallet, you're actually transferring it to yourself. You're in charge of safekeeping your Bitcoin. New message is received from Charlie. Oh. Uh, we'll so, we'll go so because the question came about wallets, uh, there's several different types of wallets that you have. They all rely on private keys. Uh, it's just where are those private keys stored? So in a software wallet, like one of these apps, for example, the, the, essentially the key is stored on your phone. Uh, so if your phone gets hacked, theoretically, you know, they can steal that private key and, you know, confiscate your Bitcoin. On the, what I have listed as uh, exchange, which should really be custodial, uh, someone else holds the key. So like, you know, as Brian mentioned, Coinbase, for example, holds your private keys. They also insure it, though. So technically, if, you know, the exchange got hacked, your Bitcoin could get stolen, and then the, ins uh, the insurance should uh, re reimburse you for that cost. Then there's hardware wallets. Those hardware wallets, keep the private key offline so that you don't have that risk of being hacked or anything like that. So with like a treasure or ledger, for example, you plug those into your computer and it signs the transaction rather than you know, releasing the, the private keys over to the, the internet. And then there's the third option, you know, keeping the wallets or encoding them onto some other piece of gold or other you know, physical item uh, where you encode the private keys. That's obviously not connected to the internet, but then you also have to have the potential risk that whoever made that or printed that made a copy of that private key, but that's beyond the scope of this, really. And that's the power of Bitcoin, right? It's, it's, it's decentralized, and you, you, you are your own bank. You own the private key. Instead of going to, ask, to, to the bank to ask for permission, you ask yourself permission to, to, to buy something. Yeah, that, that's one of the advantages of Bitcoin, because there's about two and a half billion people in the world that are unbanked. They don't have bank accounts. Um, they don't qualify for bank accounts, and they can't get bank accounts. So this allows people to have their own bank on their phone, and allows them to do commerce, which will eventually allow them to raise themselves out of poverty. They can be trade. Your uh, keys are on your phone, and your phone gets destroyed. So often with most of those apps, they have a deterministic way to create your <coughs> private key, for example. So they have you write down either you know, a set of 24 words, C words, to recreate your wallet in the event that your phone ever gets lost, destroyed, or anything like that. Yes, sir. So, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, at, Bob. at the risk of oversimplifying this, uh, which I am inclined to do, uh, 
could you maybe tell me where this falls apart? Is this equivalent to like there's commercials that movie stars make that say, buy your gold from Rosalind Capital. So mm -hmm. is this like buy my bitcoins from whoever it is and then I take my gold and I put it in my safety deposit box, which I get a key for in a bank. Yeah. Where's that breakdown to bitcoins? So I would say the, the biggest difference is that most of the time when you're buying gold, you're buying paper gold. Like you're buying a, a No, student. you can buy real gold. Well, I know, but mo like I would say most go most people that are buying gold are like buying like ETFs or or just you know okay. like a certificate of deposit that kind of thing. Uh, whereas with Bitcoin, it's essentially as long as you have your own wallet and you control your own keys, um, then it's it's like taking physical delivery of gold. There's no there's nobody that can be like oh well, you know we actually printed more paid more receipts than we actually have gold to back them. There's nothing like that unless you're using somebody else's wallet like. Like uh, the, set, the middle column here, the exchange, like Coinbase or any of the other Bitcoin exchanges, when you have money in their wallet, um, they're letting you access it, but they're, it's, not mess, not, it's not technically yours in the same sense that it is if you have your own wallet. Um, so it's, it's, if you have your own wallet, it's like taking physical delivery of gold and locking it up, and you only you have the key. Right. So question I have is uh, that this is a demand thing. So you said that the market is making the price. Today, Bitcoin's at 4,000 something. Mm -hmm. um, and if their demand continues at the rate that we're talking about, and it gets to 100,000, I can't believe that that doesn't ill affect the amount of people that are going to be able to buy Bitcoin, which would make it precipitously drop. Does that make sense in the Bitcoin world? Yeah, people won't be able to buy one full Bitcoin but you can buy a thousandth of a Bitcoin or a hundred thousand, it's divisible. Okay. Yeah, it's really a speculation on a limited amount of coins. Well, the, the, well, that's not the speculation. We know it's a limited amount. Yeah, that's, that, that's a fixed, that's a known thing. What, what's the, the speculation is how many people will be using it in the future. Right. If more people are using it, then the value's going to go up. If fewer people are going to use that, the value's not going down. If they embrace it, it'll go up. Yep. At the last meeting, August 3rd, you said the Bitcoin was 2,200, but you know, on, on some bits it says, what, buy for $2,400 sell for uh, sell, sell for 4000 Okay, so I'm a business person, and back in August 3rd, I, I sold something for 2000 worth because I got one Bitcoin. And then I guess in my taxes it show that that's my income. But then what happens? Also, the gross get declared to the government for the extra four thousand, two thousand dollars. Yes. Yeah, so when you when you sell Bitcoin, you owe capital short or long term capital gains yeah. depending on how long you owned it for on the difference in price. So if you bought, if you received the Bitcoin, bought it, whatever. So it'd be a capital gains discussion. Yeah. So, at, at so you got to hang on for seven years to get that advantage. One, one year. One year. Yeah. Long term capital gains is. Than one year and, and then Congress is uh, working on legislation right now that it's called the de minimis rule that if you have a gain of less than six hundred dollars, you don't have to claim it. Do the other cryptocurrencies have the same uh, have a limit, much like Bitcoin does, where it's twenty one million to the Ethereum and everything? They're all different. They're all different, but they all have ceilings. Limits? No, 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 no. So they all have different um, software and the software determines what the rules are. So there are some that have like a fixed uh, permanent inflation forever. Like, you know, there's always this many coins created every year after a certain point. Whereas with Bitcoin, um, essentially in like 40 years or so, there will be almost no Bitcoins, new Bitcoins created. Like we'll be at 98% or something like that of all the Bitcoins that will be created. Who set that limit? 21 million. Satoshi. 
and everyone who decides to keep using this. In other words, possibly an artificial intelligence, in other words, <laughs> not a real person behind any of this. I mean, they're probably, it's probably like one or two people, I would, if I had to actually guess, but um, I don't know if we'll ever know who Satoshi is. And the, the real, we do know there is an address that's holding one million bitcoins, and we think it's Satoshi's Wait, address. Yeah. No, there's, there's a, a bunch of addresses. There's a bunch of addresses that they do. Right? Yeah, so like, basically, in, in the early days of Bitcoin, you would just download the Bitcoin software, there's only one, and then there was an option in the software that said, generate Bitcoins. And it would just it would sit there and use 100 percent of your your computer's uh, processing power, and then maybe in a week or so you'd be like, boom, I just got 50 bitcoins. That was how like Bitcoin used to work a long time ago. Uh, and so by analyzing the the, the very early uh, created bitcoins, people were kind of able to look at um, some of the details of the transactions and be like, okay, well it looks like all of these are done by the same individual or group, or whatever. Uh, and those are the ones that we think are Satoshi's coins, which adds up to about a million bitcoins. But they've never moved, so we don't know if they still, if, you know, if they still have the keys, if the keys get lost, or, or what. That's also the anonymity of crypto. I mean, you don't know the name, address, where it's owned. You just don't, that address owns that many bitcoins. Yeah, it's like an email address. You know, you, you, know, you, you have an email address, but you know, you don't have your name on your email address, no one would know that it's you. What happens with the million that are sitting there? Is that number one? I don't think anybody heard him say that. Uh, he asked, what, what happens with the million that's sitting there? We do know, Brian, you, you explained this the best. Uh, there is a certain percentage of Bitcoins that get lost, thrown away. Uh, yeah, about 10% of the Bitcoin that's ever been created, um, people have lost their private keys. So it's about 1.6 million Bitcoins. Yeah, that people don't have access to. I had a friend at Wash U that was mining bitcoins when it first started and, and, and threw away his hardware, his old computer. <laughs> when it was worth only a penny of piece. So he, he's, he's out in the, on the Today they're worth about $4 million. Uh, so you guys understand this really well, so this question may be hard for you to answer, but you know, a lot of the questions are circulating around fears because we don't understand it. What fears do you have? Like, there's got to be some. If you say the valuation is between zero and a million dollars, that's a huge range. So there's got to be some skepticism from your side because of the unknown. Like, what, what, what makes you guys nervous about this? I mean, for for me, nothing about the system makes me nervous. It just uh, the question. The only question is if people will adopt it. So if it becomes wide, I think there's basically two futures for Bitcoin, one, one, or, the, one or the two. Uh, I don't know which one will come about, and I don't know the probabilities of you know, each one coming about. But I think it's either going to be worth so much more that it's not even really worth talking about like how many dollars is Bitcoin worth. Like It would just be supplant. It would be like a global currency um, that anybody could use, anybody could send to anybody across the world. Uh, no middlemen, there's very little trust involved. You don't have to worry about the government just deciding we're going to print some more money. Just nobody can print more money in Bitcoin, um, or it just never really catches on and fizzles out, and then I think it's going to work on it. So I don't know. I'm, I'm basically my goal is to make the set the first case more like more likely to happen, um, but I don't know. I usually just tell people if you want to invest in Bitcoin, don't put more money into Bitcoin than you'd be comfortable just like lighting on fire in front of you because. That could be the end result. <laughs> what about, do you mind answering that question? Yeah, um, so when I first learned about Bitcoin almost five years ago, I thought it was a scam. Uh, I saw um, the Wickelbass twins on CNBC, uh, Tyler and Cameron and Wickelbass, they are um, the original IQ creator behind Facebook and when they were at Harvard. And they own about 1% of the world's Bitcoin. And they were on CNBC, Bitcoin was trading under $100 a Bitcoin back then, and they were talking about it. I, I thought it was like a pump and dump scheme. I thought they were just on TV trying to pump it out and there and um, And then I saw it go from like 100 up to 1200. And then I watched it crash down to, it got down to like 300. And then I got interested in it, because I'm a value investor. And I started looking into the technology behind it. And after I read the white paper, the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, um, I, I seriously could not sleep for a week. Because it clicked with me, like, oh, this is what it's about. 
and because I, I believe in the future of this. And so to, to answer your question, what I'm scared about, so my biggest fear is that um, there's what's called the Stamp Act. Um, so I think it was passed in 1904, and it specifically outlaws using tokens in the United States as currency. And the U.S. government has not enforced that yet. And, but there is a chance they may, you know, if this becomes too big and they lose control over it, or it challenges the U.S. government, there is the possibility they may start enforcing that law. And if you think that's not possible, you go look back to the 1930s, and the U.S. outlawed gold back in the 1930s as an investment. And if you own gold coins or gold bullion, you had a fork of that over to the government, and they paid you the going price of what gold was. And until 1974, when we went off the gold standard, individuals could not own gold as an investment. So that, that's my fear, is that the government thinks that this is going to be detrimental to the government, and they come in and crack down on it, shut down the exchanges, and make you turn in your Bitcoin for a certain dollar amount. And there are governments. There are governments that have accepted Bitcoin as a currency. Japan, and South Korea, and Australia. Uh, there's over 200,000 retail locations in Japan that accept Bitcoin. So there are use cases where there's hoping. And the reason why we're up here, we're just here to educate because we believe in the technology and we want what we want to share with everybody that we know or come across. But that's why we're here. Then there's China. And China. Yeah, China's doing that today. They're, yeah. they're, they said no more Bitcoin. Right. So if you're a Chinese uh, miner or you're an exchange, they're, you, know, you have to shut down. That's not true. No miners. No miners. It's not miners. Yeah, yeah, just, just exchanges. exchanges. Yeah. 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 Uh, so to put, a, but to put a probability on the U.S. enforcing the stamp act, I think it's close to zero. Because uh, you really can't stop the technology. You know, it's not like when Napster started, you can go in and shut down Napster because there's one server. Um, this is a peer-to-peer -peer distributed network. And if you shut it down in the United States, it just goes to Japan or Korea or other countries that it will support it. So there's quite a number of um, different uh, cryptocurrencies out there, uh, commonly referred to as altcoins, because they're not Bitcoin, and they're not Ethereum. Um, Ethereum, for pe people who don't know, is another very common uh, blockchain that um, supports currency, and it, it uh, is a, a general uh, contracts platform, and is very popular these days with companies that are creating new coins to publish um, what are called ICOs, or initial coin offerings, which is another whole can of worms that we probably shouldn't open. Um, but um, anyway, so a lot of these competitors, there's hundreds, and you really have to be careful because, you know, do you do your research like uh, Brian said, because a lot of them are pump and dumps. Um, but there are specialized coins, there's Ripple, there's Litecoin, and Dogecoin, which has staying power, even though it started out as a joke. Um, and so, uh, Phil, your company's working on some blockchain technology. Do you want to share that? Or yeah, that sure. So, uh, my company is working on a, a new uh, blockchain called EOS, and it's going. To, it's still early development right now, but it's going to be uh, sort of like um, Ethereum, and then it's a general purpose uh, smart contract uh, virtual machine. Uh, which is a lot of big words, but um, anyway, it, it's going to have its own currency, which is being sold right now. And actually, um, uh, something that Brian might be able to uh, talk about, they're actually not selling the EOS coin to American citizens uh, because of uh, laws and regulations and vagaries there. So the only people who can buy it are uh, people outside of the U.S. and actually right now outside of China because they're changing laws. Um, however, uh, you know you can buy them on the exchange, uh, you know, on various exchanges. Um, but what's great about the technology is that it's creating jobs. And Phil said his company's getting ready to hire a lot of uh, software 
Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're hiring a few, and, and you know, we're, we're, you know, this, this, you know, we're not really interested in, in cryptocurrency per se. We're more interested in the blockchain and, and all the other things you can do with it. Um, the whole concept I mentioned, smart contract, which is, is kind of a, a orthogonal to this, this meet here, but it's, um, you know, it's a way of creating applications to do all sorts of stuff, tracking assets, um, um, identity management, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of applications. Anything that needs um, secure and immutable histories, audit trails, and, and things like that. For instance, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll stop there. Well, the, the Equifax hack. Yeah. This, this technology could help Equifax. Um, sure, yeah. If I, well, I don't really know the details of the Equifax hack, except that it happened. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so, for instance, um, Kim Kardashian lost all of her diamonds in, um, in Paris, what, last year. There could have been, you know, because all those diamonds have uh, markers on them. If those markers were stored on a blockchain, then, then you know, she could have they could have easily been recognizable and, and un, unforgeable. You know, so if anyone tried to pawn them in a pawn shop, pawn shop would be able to remember and say, ah, they were stolen and you know, they're recovered. Uh, so that's, that's an example of, of how, how Bitcoin or blockchain could uh, improve uh, security. Or like as far as the Equifax hack goes, rather than having all of your personal information sitting in their server, they could have just had a uh, a, a link or a, 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 a fingerprint that goes towards a record in the blockchain database, um, and that's like basically the data is encrypted or it's just it's just attested to by some somebody at one time, so that you don't actually need to keep the data around in order to verify your, your identity. Um, so that's one way that you could you could basically solve the Equifax problem with the blockchain technology. Okay. Um, who's the who's the high joint? Bet for you guys for leading vendor in blockchain. What do you mean by vendor? Who over whose software is best for well, blockchain? So so there's there's several different uh, kinds of software and, and all the top ones that are available are all open source, which means that they're not controlled <laughs> by any one company. So you could download the Bitcoin or the Ethereum or the uh, EOS or, or any of the other um, but aren't they, blockchains. Aren't they specifying it by industry now? Well, for that, that's, 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 the, that's the thing. is You can take this, this basic software and then you can customize it right. to, to your industry as, as needed. So, you know, you can specialize it, um, you know, based on, on contracts. You can specialize it for healthcare and you can have a health net or you can have, you know, banking obviously or or at, you know logistics management or, or you know, whatever industry, but, but all the software is open source, so you can do this or we can do it, or you can hire someone to do it, you can hire my company to do it. <laughs> what industry do you guys see is the first mainstream adopter? I, I think it'll be the financial industry. Banking? Yeah, I mean, uh, not, not necessarily like, uh, like oh, that's what I'm looking for, like individual banking. But probably more like commercial banks, exactly. uh, banks using Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency as like a settlement system, like a better version of SWIFT or SEPA or whatever. Yeah, the remittance market is, um, you know, you know, it, it's something disrupted. Because when you transfer money across borders, remittance, like if you transfer money from the U.S. to other countries, if you do like Western Union, they oh, charge okay. anywhere from you know four to eight percent transaction fee. And so, so there's a lot of money there that's you know up for grabs. If I'm getting ready to go to the UK and I want to exchange dollars to pounds, it'd be an avenue would be use the blockchain technology. Well, he's talking more about like if you're from the Philippines and you come to the US to work and you want to send money back home. Okay. That's sure. that's what remit, that's generally what remains is. You would send it back and the Right. So, so when I was in London last week, I actually um, met someone who was a, a, a citizen of the uh, Caribbean, and she was living in 
London and wants to send money back to her brother. The Western Union was charging her 10% to, con to convert to Caribbean dollars. So if she was able to use the Bitcoin, um, then, you know, of course, she'd be able to send 10% more back to her family. So the, the world spends $700 billion a year transferring money. That, that's, that's the amount of fees that we pay to be out of all the fees in the world, transfer money, $700 billion. And this technology makes the transfer of money almost free. So it's just like when the internet started, people started reading information on the computer rather than reading newspapers, and that hurt the newspapers. And when voice over IP started, like Skype, that made long distance free, right? So we don't want people long distance anymore, do we? You know, and this technology is going to make transferring money free. It's going to take 10 or 20 years, but eventually we're not going to be spending $700 billion a year transferring money. You think that's the timeline, 10 to 20? Yeah. 10 to 20. Yeah. So just to go back, how, how could it affect uh, the U.S. dollar or any other currency for that matter if it's an independent uh, currency of its own? Uh, I mean, it would be, I'm imagining a scenario in which people just stop wanting dollars, like foreign countries stop wanting dollars. Something, yeah, I mean, I don't see any reason why that couldn't happen. So to that point, I believe in, uh, in Zimbabwe, Bitcoin's currently trading in, if you were to convert the currency to US dollars, by Bitcoin, about seventy-two hundred dollars, because there's a lot of concern over the Zimbabwe dollar uh, going to hyperinflation again, like we saw in Afghanistan. I don't remember the exact date, but whenever the last hyperinflation cycle occurred, so people didn't want uh, Bitcoin because they believe it's going to hold more value than the Zimbabwe dollar. Just real, real quick, just for clarification, for my so I can understand this. You're talking about a lot of different ways that uh, Bitcoin can be used, could be used, might be used. For right now, the four of you are accumulating a stash of Bitcoin. Is there some other ways that you're using Bitcoin? Are you just right now in an accumulation stage? Uh, or am I missing something here? I'd like to say something to that if I might. I think charity, not for profit, uh, are missing a, a, a really good thing if they do not set up the ability to accept Bitcoin contribution. Yeah. Because they are. Yeah. So, yeah. These gentlemen are using Bitcoin to exactly. other than to acquire wealth. 60 to 70 percent of the ownership of Bitcoin is for investment purposes today. And that's because people that buy it think it's going to be worth more in the future. But once it's worth more in the future, then people are more likely to spend it if you think it's not as you know, valuable in the future. So, so right now, most people that buy Bitcoin want to own it just because they think it's going to be worth more. So to answer your question, I, I don't like to spend my Bitcoin. Because it's like, you know, if I think it's going to be worth more, then you know, I'm hurting myself rather than spending somewhere else. Brian, you know, you can get Thea Bowman School to open a... Uh, We're doing that already. There you go. Yeah. And, and Channel 9 is about to do it, by the way, public uh, broadcasting. And Gary just set up the Joshua Chamberlain Society uh, with a Bitcoin address, so people will be coming. We're trying to educate half the profits and institutions. Right. Uh, we have to do it. Yes, so a couple more, and then I think we're going to get kicked out. Then 6 o'clock, Chuck Berry room, uh, first come, first serve. We'll have more details about blockchain, crypto, Bitcoin, whatever. So we have this reserve. I have 10, about 15 people in there. So that's at 6 o'clock, Chuck Berry right down the hall. Yes, sir. My question probably is in the child camp. Okay, yeah, yeah. Just more detail, yes. Yeah. What is the retail penetration you to be before average December when it's actually the able to so, so right now, there's in the world, there's 3.7 billion internet users. There's 18 million Bitcoin wallets. So there's about a half a percent of internet users have a Bitcoin wallet. 
so it's very small. Yeah. You're, you're asking this for the retail penetration, right? Like, yeah, because let's say 10 years from now, I've got this big stash of Bitcoin, right? And so now I'm going to go out and buy a car, and I, you know, accelerate to that extent. So when I go out and buy my Ford car, is that dealer going to be able to sell my Bitcoin? What's that penetration in terms of like retail usage? I mean, I don't know what it's going to be like in 20 years, but uh, right now, like brick and mortar retail is very low. Like most of the Bitcoin, most of the businesses that accept Bitcoin retail are online. But it doesn't matter either because you could always convert your Bitcoin to dollars and then spend your dollars buying more. Is Amazon gonna do it? Yeah. Maybe Overstock is doing it. No, there's several others that are doing it. Where is your ATM? Where is your ATM? Uh, uh, yeah. We have we have four locations. We have one in Sister Cities on South, on South Broadway, one on Washington Avenue downtown at the Over Under, uh, one at the Chase Park Plaza Theater, and one at the Gallery Theater. It's good to get some good stuff on. Uh, S U G E T S U M E I T S. You can do all the things. Thanks everybody for coming. We'll see you in the Chuck Berry room.